Gresham College presents Philanthropy Then, Philanthropy Now by Julia Unwin, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation. My title is, as Sir Roderick said, Philanthropy Then, Philanthropy Now, and I'm talking from the perspective of someone who runs one of the great foundations of this country in a place that was founded by one of the great philanthropists in this country, Sir Thomas Gresham. And I do think there's a powerful link to be made between those two individuals, but particularly what I want to do in this le lecture is focus on what happens next. There are two ways to change the world, at least there are only two if you've decided to avoid a path of violence and force. And for the purpose of this lecture, in this spectacular hall, I intend to confine myself to the lawful, if not the necessarily moral. You can be elected, you can appeal to the popular will, secure a mandate for change and deliver a programme of government or you can have a lot of money. For centuries, indeed millennia, money has talked. Money has provided power and money has changed the world. For those of us with a vaguely liberal democratic constitution, this is not necessarily a comfortable truth. Indeed, we've been raised to know that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And many of us have therefore developed a rather uncertain, ambivalent, maybe even slightly queasy relationship with money. We know in our hearts that democracy and money battle it, battle, it, battle it out rather asymmetrically. And whenever we look at a particular instance of social or policy change, it's not hard to see money winning, but this leaves a sour taste in the mouth and a vaguely expressed desire to see democracy and the electoral route to social change triumph. After all, whether achievable or not, the popular will seems to most of us to be a both a more sound arbiter and an infinitely preferable adjudicator of preference. Well, maybe. But what we also know in our hearts is that when we look at some of the big changes in our society, the emancipation of women, the creation of the NHS, the development of a viable transport infrastructure, the introduction of national insurance and a system of universal social security, the drive to improve public health, and the massive post-war house building programme, democracy has been fantastically important. But money too has spoken. The state has had its way, but so too has the market. And historians and political analysts can debate in detail which came first and which allowed change. But we, the spectators of social change, know that there are two ways to change the world. One is by being elected, and the other is by having a lot of money. Which brings us neatly to philanthropy. Because philanthropy really means the distribution of a lot of money and using it for some, sometimes rather loosely defined, social good. And those of us with a slightly queasy relationship to the power of money can feel good about this power. We believe its use does actually allow us entry to the kingdom of heaven, whether in this world or the next. And we somehow exempt it from our structures about the demonic power of money. After all, didn't one of the greatest philanthropists ever, Andrew Carnegie, say, he who dies rich dies disgraced? And aren't we all encouraged to give away what we have and to avoid the damaging power of money? Tonight, I'm going to argue that philanthropy has power because it has money. That that power can corrupt and can damage as much as it can enhance and change. And that the history of philanthropy over the last century suggests that the power of philanthropy is by no means an unalloyed good. And just like the power of all money, we need to think carefully, judge precisely, and challenge bravely if we're not to collude with the increasingly dangerous view that money talks, money has power and money must therefore be obeyed. But first, a personal admission. I'm no objective observer of this tangled ethical debate. When just over five years ago I was appointed as the next director of the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, I got many kind notes of congratulations. One that will stay with me forever came from the late Robin Guthrie, my predecessor but one. Congratulations, he said. You'll never have to buy your own lunch again. But on the other hand, you'll never hear the truth again. He later told me that this was an exact replica of a note he'd received on his appointment, and I dare say I'll pen something similar to my successor. Because however much we comply with the Bribery Act and our submission to the rigours of modern internal audit, power corrupts, and a lot of money that's not your own can corrupt absolutely, to paraphrase Lord Acton. So I too know that the power of philanthropy is not straightforward, that it can blind us to the truth, can protect us from reality, and can distort decision-making, just as surely as any other use of money. But philanthropy then. I'm not going back as far as the Middle Ages. I'm talking about 1904, when Joseph Rowntree set up the four trusts which today bear his name. He'd already made a significant impact on his world. 
As a wealthy and very successful businessman, he developed a company with a massive reach, powerful brand, as we would now say, and a challenging ethos. He'd contributed personally to the development of charitable and educational services, and in the development of New Earswick, the village for his workers and managers that he developed in York, had struck a big and powerful blow for a humanised and civilised approach to capitalism. He'd also achieved personal recognition for his good works, and as a freeman of the city of York, had the respect and admiration of his peers. In endowing, in, in endowing the group of trusts, he recognised that times would change, that approaches would differ, but clearly commissioned them to change the face of England. No shrinking violet, he. No tentative suggestion that his funds just might add a small bit of icing to an already rich fruitcake. No, he spelt out ambition and a desire to change the world that seems to me to have been typical of men of his generation, time and wealth. In ringing tones, he commanded his trust to search out the underlying causes of weakness or evil in the community, rather than remedying their more superficial manifestations. And with the optimism that so characterised the turn of the 20th century, he declared his hope that with goodwill and knowledge, all problems could be solved. If the enormous volume of the philanthropy of the present day, he said, were wisely directed, it would, I believe, in the course of a few years, change the face of England. So the intellectual architecture left by Joseph Rantry was a questing one, a commitment to finding out, to learning and to understanding. And the intention was clearly to aim for change. He was not interested, as he said, probably to the lasting irritation of the soup kitchen charities in York, in funding the soup kitchen in York. Not because he didn't think it was worthwhile. He'd already devoted much of his life to causes which aimed to alleviate and relieve the poor of their misery. But in setting up his trust towards the end of that dedicated life, he wanted the considerable fortune he had amassed to be spent in securing lasting change. Joseph Roundry didn't just leave us the intellectual architecture which to this day defines our mission. He also, at least with the help of Parker and Unwin, no relation but a great architect, built the garden village of New Earswick as a genuine mixed community with housing for workers and managers, all in a green setting with gardens for each home, each with a fruit tree. The village of New Earswick, which we manage to this day, takes its place historically as part of the garden village movement and along with Bourneville, Salt Airport, Sunlight and others, was a living demonstration of the way in which good quality housing in a green and pleasant environment could allow people to lead fulfilled lives, able to strengthen the bonds of community. Joseph Rantry's commitment to this was such that he also urged his trust to maximise the control that residents could have. I do not want to establish communities bearing the stamp of charity, he said, but rather of rightly ordered and self-governing communities but ever the realistic businessman, self-governing that is within the broad limits laid down by the trust. In doing so, he promoted a degree of self-governance that even today, in a climate in which government white papers describe empowerment, seems challenging and demanding. Today, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation and the Joseph Rowntree Housing Trust together share a purpose, which has its roots in that famous memorandum. We search finding out the reasons why, developing a world-class research programme to understand and propose solutions. We demonstrate different ways of tackling difficult and entrenched problems. And we influence, working with those who have power to make sure that the voice, the needs and the demands of those who have been dispossessed can be heard at the highest levels. The optimism and sense of purpose that was the founding principle for the Joseph Rowntree Foundation was, as I say, typical of the age. The 19th century had, after all, brought almost unimaginable change and transition to the UK. The apparently breakneck speed of industrialisation and the move of so many people from the countryside was truly shocking. In this country and in the United States, people left long-standing rural communities, which, while they should never be romanticised as pre-lapsarian idols, did provide continuity, stability and certainty, and deeply repressive moral codes keeping all in order. People left this along with grinding poverty for the chaos, confusion and squalor of the cities. To respond to this, both here and in the United States, a multitude of new institutions were founded by churches, trade unions, universities, and of course, by those energetic driven philanthropists. Boys and girls brigades, mothers unions, university settlements, housing estates and soup kitchens, moral rearmament, help for fallen women, schools and working men's colleges, hospitals, asylums and clinics orphanages and libraries. 
the late 19th century and early 20th century positively bristled with intervention and activity to protect and support, chivvy and control the rapidly growing working class and the terrifying and potentially dangerous underclass. From Mayhew to Orwell and all points in between, the bitter cry of outcast London, in the words of Gareth Steadman Jones, resonated with activity and action. Civil society built civil institutions. It did so with vigour and energy and drive. In all of this, philanthropy was no observer. It was an active and engaged driver. That part of their legacy is with us wherever we look at the urban landscape. They joined the great medieval guilds such as the Mercers and the, foundation, foundation, the founders of establishments such as Gresham College in changing the face of our civic life in response to upheaval, transition and change. But this period of transition didn't just build institutions. They also questioned and researched. Some, like Joseph Rowntree and his son Sebum, can truly claim to be the fathers of modern social policy, investigating root causes, assembling data, seeking to understand. Other, others, like the Webbs in their tireless construction of alternative ways of living, supported the establishment and growth of the London School of Economics. With their absolute commitment to the possibility of improvement, their drive for betterment, and their certainty that all could be well, they are indeed or inspiring, quite frightening. The Roundtree's own view seemed to have been that once the information was known, a good society would act. And indeed, in the establishment of national insurance in 1911, we can draw some comfort from the fact that influence, driven by good research evidence, is indeed directly possible. A spirit of scientific and rational inquiry, a very early 20th century conviction that absolute betterment was within their grasp, combined with an energetic commitment to good order and the power of excellent administration, quite a legacy for some powerful and rich individuals. Combined with the institutional architecture left by them, their legacy is monumental. In the buildings, the institutions and the thinking, there is indeed an unbroken thread of inquiry, provision, organisation. And this thread has survived through the creation of the welfare state, its development and the many changes to society. So philanthropy then, to use the title of this lecture, delivered, and it delivered things that did indeed change the face of England. Philanthropy followed Goethe's injunction. Whatever you can do or dream you can, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. But poverty and disadvantage did not disappear. Indeed, it grew, developed, changed character. And in this exploration of the power of philanthropy, starting with my opening words, namely there are two ways to change the world, and one of them is to have money, preferably lots of it, there are lessons for us all. Nearly five decades ago, Pre President Johnson, no great friend of the Liberal Guardian reading left-leaning redistributors, declared a war on poverty. Speaking for many in the affluent and developed world, he refuted the suggestion that poverty is always with us, arguing instead that the benign intervention of the state those elected to change the world, could indeed so order our affairs that there would be no need for poverty. Echoing the turn of the century philanthropists I've described in the UK, he argued that a combination of institution building and evidence investigation could together create the right administrative conditions to end poverty as we know it. And yet the war has not been won, either in the USA or the UK. This is not a lecture with masses of data, but before proceeding I need to explain what I mean. Let's just look at the UK. In the year 2009-10, to 3.8 million children were in poverty, 29% of children in the UK. In other age groups, 25% of working age adults with dependent children were in poverty, 20% of working age adults without children, and 16% of pensioners. There are nearly 3 million people unemployed, and there are 6 million people underemployed. 85% of households in the bottom fifth are in fuel poverty. And so the figures go on. The war on poverty has not been won. Argue if you like about the statistics. Measure the numbers differently if you like. Decide that a certain percentage more accurately reflects the truth as you would like to see it. But remember this, poverty attenuates the human spirit. It reduces capacity. It causes ill health. Poverty strips people of their ability to contribute. It fosters division and it degrades those who experience it. We haven't won the war on poverty. Instead, we have experienced a war on the poor. And it seems to me that that particular war is doing rather well. Read the newspapers in the UK, both the popular and the not so popular ones. The poor are described as other. 
living entirely separate and different lives, dependent on handouts which then fuel an entirely feckless life, interesting only through a sort of morbid fascination. The poor are depicted as people of unfathomable hopelessness, making a series of more or less disastrous choices which condemn them to a life entirely different to that of the rest of us all. And what is more goes the battle cry of this particular war. Their very poverty threatens us and damages our way of life. It costs us eye-watering sums of money provided by the hard-working and diligent majority to maintain the feckless indigent poor. No longer is there any dignity in poverty. No way can you find the praise for those who manage on so little when the rest of us waste so much. Nowhere is there respect for those who labour for low pay. No, they are to be feared and loathed. They've joined the great unknown. An investigation by Joseph Rantry Foundation, the public's view of modern social evils, echoing Joseph Rantry's original injunction to go forth and find out what evils are, identified fear of others as one of the new social evils of the 21st century. It seems to me that the palpable coarsening of the debate about people living in poverty, including the extraordinarily savage levels of attack on people who are disabled and unwell, and unwell suggests they may be right. In our increasingly segmented society, poor people are the other, that it is legitimate to despise, fear and ignore. All rational thinking and evidence refutes this. We know that most people in poverty are working and working hard. We know that at a time of rising unemployment, the requirement to work is difficult. We know that the children of people who are poor struggle to do as well as others. We know, in short, it's better to be a stupid child than a poor one. We know that it is poverty that contributes to and causes alcohol and drug abuse, broken marriages and abandoned children. We know all of this. And yet as society, we allow the poor to be dismissed and demonized. How did this happen? The war on the poor, I'm going to argue, was a funded one. Just as the democratically elected government of President Johnson declared war on poverty, so too did a group of powerful, well-resourced and, yes, philanthropic institutions declare war on the poor. There was no public declaration, no manifesto was published, no statement at a press conference, but a new war of ideas was launched in the United States in the 1960s. Funded by a group of disparate and different foundations, they built new institutions, recruited and supported intellectual warriors, invested heavily in communications. They influenced policy and political discourse by investing in both the institutional and the intellectual architecture of the USA. They funded academic scholarship, leadership programs and policy advocacy. They've used the tools of philanthropy just as surely as their predecessors and they've constructed a powerful, compelling and currently triumphant policy framework with elements we know too well. And good arguments. Arguments for a small state, for minimal and conditional welfare, and a reliance on faith communities as the glue that combined a fractured community. Combined with a sexual orthodoxy, resistance to the emancipation of women, and barely concealed hostility to black and minority ethnic communities, the modern day Tea Party draws much of its power from the long term, patient, and very thoughtful investment by a group of wealthy foundations. They created the space in which politicians can move. Thomas Frank, in his recently published Pity the Billionaire, asked the question that fascinates us all. How did it become accepted wisdom that the poor were primarily responsible for the global financial crisis that brought Western capitalism to its knees? And a host of investigations, including The Right Nation by John Micklethwaite from The, Independent, from the Economist, conclude that philanthropy has power and influence beyond its wildest dreams. There are two important things to say about this work. The first is that describing this intervention in this way does not imply subscription to some overarching conspiracy theory. I'm not suggesting anything of the sort. I'm deeply skeptical of the notion that anything is done through organized conspiracies. What this story shows is not conspiracy. It shows instead the power of money and the ability of careful intervention to change the world. And the second thing about what I'm describing is it was entirely proper. Independent organisations must, in a free society, be allowed to use their resources as they wish. And it's, of course, entirely proper to try to change the world. Firm ideological views do not make people bad. Indeed, the foundations which supported this work were all focused resolutely and honestly on making a better society. It's just that they start from a different stance from me. As do we all start from different stances. Philanthropy is never neutral. In this case, it seems to me that the power of philanthropy worked. The war on the poor is, if not won, certainly not lost. 
the war on poverty still has some considerable way to go. I have so far in this lecture described the impact of philanthropy through some big social changes. The 19th and early 20th century saw a massive upheaval, and in response, philanthropy supported institutions, built the architecture of modern civil society, researched, wrote, and argued for a different world. So too in the 1960s, a period of huge social upheaval saw the flowering of a great many organisations, the launch of liberation movements and global solidarity, and also, as I've sketched out here, the concerted intervention of a number of large philanthropic bodies which shaped political discourse and created the environment for another sort of change. So philanthropy now. We now face a period of transition as deep and as profound as any that we've experienced before. In our highly globalised world, we in the UK face a number of major transitions. We face first the transition to coping with less. Less money, fewer resources, the imminence of peak oil, the worldwide shortage resource that we've merrily plundered over the decades. Managing with less and dealing with the twin deficits, the economy and the environment, both created by an unsustainable way of living, is a challenge of our time, and the transition to this new state will test us as we've never been tested before. We also face the transition to living with uncertainty. Argue, if you like, about the detail of climate change. Quibble with some of the projections. Hide away and pretend it isn't happening. But recent research published by the Joseph Rantry Foundation confirms that whatever the detail, in the UK we will face extreme weather events, heat waves and floods. And that even with all our 21st century technology, our power to predict, protect and respond will not protect us from that uncertainty. So that's the second area of transition, getting used to that sort of uncertainty. And the third big area of transition is the transition to a new demography, a new pattern of population. We face demographic change on a scale we have not experienced before. It's not just that there are 12,500 people over 100, and probably more since I wrote this, and we can confidently predict the moment when there'll be 100,000. It's not just that a child born today has a pretty good chance of living to 125. It's not just that a severely disabled child born today has an infinitely better chance of surviving to healthy and productive adulthood. It is not just that the ethnic and religious makeup of our country is more diverse than at any stage in our history, and what only becomes more so, whatever the formulations of politicians. It's not just that we will witness our first minority majority cities in the next decade, those cities which can boast of a majority population drawn from those who are once a minority. It's not only that people suffering terrible mental distress can, through the use of advanced psychotropic drugs, lead full and engaged lives. It is the combination of all of these changes that make the demography of future decades in the UK and across the developed world both a huge opportunity and a massive challenge. So a period of transition and disruption with challenges from the economy, from the environment and from our own demography. Challenges that can overwhelm us and can result in renewed war on the poor, as people who are vulnerable for whatever reason are blamed for our predicament. A war in which the victims could be blamed for any exercise of rights, resulting in a divided society, where money talks, as it always has done, but it talks to, talks to protect the wealthy, protect their power, and ensure a safe passage through transition. Or we can work towards a just transition characterised by a renewed and different social contract suitable for the 20th century. Crafting the 21st century social contract, the process by which we determine the balance of responsibility between the individual, the community, the market and the state, is not a job for faint hearts. It will require the same boldness, the same steely focus, and the same power of organisation that we have seen characterised by UK philanthropy in the 19th century. To achieve a just transition, I believe we'll need the behaviours and tools of philanthropy during earlier transitions. But our times are different, and we will also need different behaviours and different tools. Philanthropy then was bold and determined, and we need, too need to be bold and determined. We need to be absolutely sure what we stand for. And we need a confidence in our actions that comes not from our wealth and our position in society, but from our knowledge, our experience and our evidence. But philanthropy then was also a philanthropy of the very rich, assuming a very precise correlation between their wealth and their wisdom. Philanthropy now needs to show a humility that our illustrious founders didn't really need to worry about. If we've learned anything in the last century, and we have to hope we've learned a lot, the first must be that no single organisation or sector can deliver social change alone. 
And the first humility must be humility to people who are themselves in the front line of this transition. Unless we're shaped by the voices, experience, aspirations, and desires of people who are themselves facing poverty, we will continue to get it badly wrong. Philanthropy now will need to support institutions as it always did. And it will need to support the gathering of evidence as it always did. But philanthropy now will also need to recognise that it's not the sayings of great men that change the world. It is the power of organised and frequently desperately disorganised movements of people, enabled and connected through a, a technology the 19th century could not begin to imagine that will drive real and lasting change. Financing, supporting and enabling movements and networks and investment in the engineering of social change as much as in its architecture is our new priority. Modern philanthropy will need to support the dissemination and curation of information as much as the collection. It will support networks of people as much as institutions, and it will enable dialogue as much, if not more, than broadcast. 19th century philanthropy built monuments, both material and intellectual. The architects of our welfare state were supported and enabled by the work of those important philanthropists and their support for institutional change. In our current period of transition, we are called to do nothing less. But we will do it, I believe, through networks of people. And we will, I would contend, put up more tents than we will build palaces. Because at a time of rapid change, when information can circumnavigate the globe in less time than a keystroke, we need flexibility, responsiveness, and the ability to move rapidly. As organizations that can drive, can convene, can act as a catalyst, and can be good partners, Philanthropic institutions can use our skills and our position to enable those who are able to make change. But we also need to affirm the same values that inspired philanthropy then. An absolute belief in the importance of every human being. An overriding commitment to secure a settlement in which all can flourish. And the prospect of better lives for all. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation, in the second decade of its second century, retains a commitment to being bold, to sharing evidence, to showing as well as telling. In that, it can trace an unbroken thread to its founder. It also has an unshakable commitment to the eradication of poverty, the promotion of social justice, and the erosion of inequality. We have also, this year, committed to being an anti-poverty organization, declaring that we are independent. Indeed, we are independent, but we are by no means neutral. We intend to use the tools at our disposal. Some of these we hold in common with philanthropy in times gone by. We house and employ people, and we can do both in ways that strive to help people move out of poverty. We continue to shine a very bright light in what is happening in the UK and report it in ways that everyone can hear. We research the breadth and depth of poverty as well as the cause and the effect of it. And, and in so doing, we contribute to the institutions of the thinking that can themselves eradicate poverty. But we will need to do some things differently. We need to serve, not lead, recognizing the skills, abilities, and power of those in the front line. And we recognize that influence is not linear. Networks of power and networks of influence drive change in our much more open, much more plural society. I hope that I've demonstrated that just as philanthropy can work for good and indeed for ill, it also cannot stay still. If it's to retain its power to change the world, it needs to be ever alert to the new ways in which this can be done. Philanthropy in the future will look different again. 21st century philanthropy will need to continue to engage with the big issues, and no bigger issue faces us than the nature of the future of capitalism. In our global and digital world, this will inevitably look different. Modern philanthropy will need to embrace the philanthropy of ideas, and there will need to be a new emphasis on the essential generosity of philanthropy, not just in terms of money, but also in the gathering, distribution, and communication of ideas. To do this, we need to be open about our process, engaged in our decision-making, hospitable, generous, and permeable in ways that we may not have always demonstrated. As we work through the transitions of the next few decades, we will in turn be challenged as never before. And if we are to retain the respect of a world increasingly skeptical about the power of money, we had better start organizing ourselves in ways that demonstrate our right to try to contribute to the debate. Otherwise, we are simply, as philanthropic organizations, the acceptable face of money, and money, as we've seen, is not in itself a good enough justification for seeking to change the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julia, for that very thoughtful presentation of these issues. Uh, we don't do have time for questions, and um, Lauren will give you a microphone. 
please introduce yourself briefly when you ask a question. Um, and over there, but while, while the microphone's going over there, let me ask one. Um, you didn't say anything, Julia, about the, the role of the state, but of course the state is involved in encouraging philanthropy through various forms of tax exemptions and, and um, uh, support of the gift aid schemes and so on. Um, and it's also involved in the charitable the workings of the charitable sector through, um, uh, again, relief on, on, on uh, various forms of expenditure and um, through the Charity Commission. What do you see as the, the future role of the state in encouraging and regulating philanthropy? Philanthropy existed long before the state became involved in these issues, and I think it will continue to exist long after. I could easily give you a lecture, which I won't promise to do this now, about the relationship between philanthropy and the state, but what I was trying to do is construct a story about what philanthropy has achieved within and around and beside the state. The welfare state, a hugely important, significant creation of our times, was fueled and created and shaped by philanthropy. The changes that are taking place in the welfare state are being fueled and supported in that way. Tax benefits come and go. The motivation and impetus to give, to give and to see what happens next and to empower other people to do one, seems to me to be bigger than any state intervention. So while I would hugely welcome tax reliefs, I was for five years in my life a charity commission and I think commissioner and I think regulation of the charity sector is important. I also think it's fantastically important that the voluntary sector stands up on its own and sets its own priorities. And when they coincide with those of the state, we will do great business together. But when they don't, we have a different mission and a different purpose, and it's one we have to hold dear. My question was kind of linked to that. My name's Adele Thackeray. I'm a member of the Securities Institute, but at the moment, unsalaried, so certainly not one of the super rich, I'm afraid. <laughs> Um, you know, given that the incentives for rich people to give in this country have been uh, lessened, let's say, by the budget last week with the threshold of £50,000 a year, somebody told me that's because the Liberal Party thought that people only gave money to charity to dodge tax. And I wonder what your feelings were on that. I was shocked when I heard that. Do you, can you I've heard any... lots of <coughs> theories about why they did this in the budget. That's not one I've heard, but it might be true. Nobody in this country would give money to dodge tax because you don't dodge tax. All the tax reliefs that you get if you give money to charity go to the charity. So it is not in an individual's interest in that way to do it. It's incredibly important for the charitable sector that we retain those reliefs because that's money coming into the charitable sector. I don't know why it happened in the budget. I suspect, I don't believe in conspiracies, I believe in accidents. I think a lot of it, they don't, I don't think they thought through what the implications would be and they are severe indeed. It's very different in the United States where incentives actually protect the person who gives and people are advised that there are tax efficient ways of giving which are efficient for them and not for the recipient. Um, but we have always in this country maintained the view that the tax relief goes to the charity. I think that's really rather important. So it can never be confused with tax evasion of any sort. My name is Philip Dews. I'm very, very familiar with the wonderful concept of your um, Joseph Rowntree Housing Trust. I served two years in the National Service and I was uh, on officer training course with Ben Rowntree. I have no idea whether he's still alive or not. I would love to see him if he is. I live and work in Cambodia. I'm on a visit to my native London. And I had hoped if Ben was still alive, or perhaps somebody would be willing to come to Cambodia, my son is vice chancellor of one of the leading universities there, to tell us about this concept because we have very, very similar situation in Cambodia to which there was um, when the Roundtree Trust was set up. Terrible poverty among certain people very rich people who couldn't care a damn. Mm. And I do think that, um, according to your brochure, you're only in the United Kingdom. Surely, and I'd love to hear your view on this, surely you ought to uh, pass this concept to very poor and also very rich countries like Cambodia. 
I've been 12 years in Myanmar. I'd like to talk to you about Burma, but I'd particularly like to talk to you about Cambodia. Is it exportable? Thank you. Oh, the UK concept of philanthropy is entirely exportable and has been exported, has changed the world. I was talking about what we do in the UK because my Joseph Rantree Foundation is a small foundation that only works in the UK, but very many big foundations are doing extraordinarily good things. And that notion that giving money and giving it freely and enabling others to develop institutions is eminently exportable. And I'd be very happy to give you some connections with global foundations that are doing that. I understand that in the... Oh, sorry, my name's Sarah Brown. I understand in the UK that it is the poor that are better at philanthropy than the rich. I wonder if you have a view on how we can entice the rich, who are getting richer, to be more philanthropic. It's one of the shocking statistics of our time, isn't it? If you analyse Comic Relief, BBC Children in Need, any of those, it's the poorest regions of the country that give the most. And Northern Ireland, which is by most measurements the poorest part of the UK, gives the most. Reams have been written about why this is the case. I think there is a sense of solidarity, a recognition that the poor are not completely other if you live closer to them. I believe that in Northern Ireland particularly there's a faith component and people give because of the faith they've grown up in. Um, but it's one of the shocking stories of our time. And it's not just proportionately. In many giving things, like those appeals, it's absolutely they give more. It's not just they give a higher proportion of their wealth, they are absolutely those regions are contributing more. How can we persuade the rich to give more? Well, many, many people have done a lot of work on it, and I think we need to invest in different ways of making that possible. A number of things that have been imported, particularly from the USA, as I'm speaking entirely personally, I have my doubts about. There is a very strong movement for getting very rich people very heavily involved in the management of charities because that will help them give. I've worked as an advisor long before I was at JRF with many very rich people who thought it would be easy to run a charity and went a little bit pale when they saw quite how difficult it was to do. I think there's an arrogance of the very wealthy that isn't necessarily as helpful as it might be when people think that they know exactly how to run a business. That being said, when people give money and also give time, it can be absolutely transformative. But the confidence we need to have in the charitable sector is to say, some of what we're doing, we know how to do it, and we're making a very good offer to people who want to help. Um, my name's Sandip uh, Joven Putra. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned um, new philanthropies investing in movements and networks as a potential way to um, create social change. Do you have any examples that you could share with us, people who have been doing this or are doing this at the moment? Well, I'm looking around the room because I'm sure there are colleagues of mine, yes, there are some who run other big foundations who could give you many examples. It seems to me that, I mean, I was talking about the environmental movement. Some of the funding that some of the big foundations, and not my own, have done, which have supported, say, Forum for the Future, which the organisation Jonathan Porritt set up, that empowered a whole lot of other people to take action and move, was just as influential as some of the funding that would have supported some of the stuff we've done, which is build houses that are environmentally friendly. There are just different interventions. And I think what I was trying to say is that we could... Building institutions, both virtual and real, is one way of doing things. Recognising that activity and change make a difference too is another. My analogy with the 1960s in the United States would be um, the campaigners for black people to be enfranchised, which were supported by many of the radical foundations. I think we have to do brave things like that where we see injustice. But it's difficult to do because charity law allows you most readily to give to other charities. We will have to find clever ways of doing it, but we can certainly find them. We can find clever ways of doing things. Hello, I'm Frank Cox. I'm a fellow of Gresham College. Um, you've talked about the good side of philanthropy. Um, the downside, um, certainly in biomedical research, is that many of the grants given actually st um, stagnate research. Um, by giving money to what is successful um, rather than um, open field research. The Wellcome Trust, of course, is a shining example of how that has totally changed. Um, would you like to comment, not only in that field, but um, the dangers that can be imposed on organisations and by reliance um, on philanthropy? I hope I didn't say philanthropy was always good, because I don't think it is. 
I don't think it's a word that should be treated as, I said, it's, it's not neutral. It does things and influences what happens. I think there's a huge amount of philanthropic decision making which has been obscure, difficult to understand, cowardly because it's supported what is already successful rather than brave in supporting what might be new. It's a huge temptation if you're involved in giving away other people's money, which is the privilege that anyone who's a trustee or anyone who works for trustees, as I do, have. You want to make sure it works, so you put the money in somewhere that will be a safe delivery. But I think there are fields of activity where philanthropy has not done itself credit, has funded the wrong thing or carried on funding the same thing, has not been courageous. Um, and I hope that what I was trying to give was a message about how we could get better as we move into these more difficult times. I do think the funding of research, and we fund social policy research, is particularly difficult in this field. We will go through, as do the Welcome for Trust and enough field and all of the others who fund research, very big processes to make sure it's as fair and open and transparent as we can be. But we are also focused on making change happen. And so the very real risk is the challenge which we put to me is you're only funding things that give you the answer you wanted. I'm absolutely clear that's not what we're doing, but that's always a risk you have to be open to. Uh, my name is Tim Fright. I'm from the Shackleton Foundation, and I was interested to hear your thoughts on how the internet has changed both charity and philanthropy so far, and uh, how it will change charitable giving and philanthropic giving in the future. Well, it would be a very foolish person indeed who said how we think it will change, because most of what's happened, none of us even three years ago knew could happen. I think the scale and pace of change is extraordinary. There is figures, aren't there? It took 50 years for everyone to have a television, 25 to have a telephone, two years for everyone to get on the internet. You know, the pace of that has been enormous. And the internet and social media in general. Five years ago, people used to say it will change how we do things. And I used to say that. I was completely wrong. It's changed what we do. It hasn't just changed the method, it's changed what we do. So how we communicate, how we share information, how we create information, the notion of expert has all been exploded by the power of the internet. And we are in a period of transition, and I don't know where that will end because I'm not an expert, but I talk to experts and they don't know either. We are in a process of transition, but we don't know what it will look like next. What I do know is we have to be absolutely open to it and we have to recognise that the changes this is bringing in are not just about how we do things, they're about what we do. You only have to look at how journalism has changed. The fact that journalism is now much more about absorbing different ideas, collecting evidence and experience from all over the place, empowering people with no professional qualifications, and then formulating something would make most of the journalists, even of my generation, turn in their grave. But actually, journalism has changed. Philanthropy changes too, because we know so much more about what's going on. I'm talking about Cambodia. People do you remember when the monks were marching in, uh, in Burma and people had their telephones up. Around the world, we knew what was going on. Syria, the Arab Spring, all of that has been communicated around the world through those networks I was describing in ways we could not have imagined three, weeks, three years ago. We didn't know that the telephone that more people have in Africa than they have anything else would be the best way of communicating need, emergency, crisis. It's transformed what we do as well as how we do it. And I believe it will continue to do so. Uh, at the back, please. Hello, um, my name is Shanali Routry. I'm, I work for Public Concern at Work, which is a whistleblowing charity. And we're, uh, we were really grateful in the early 1990s when we started out, we got funding from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation. And as a result of that fu funding, uh, we've managed to become self-funding to some extent. Uh, and also, um, we've been able to help over 13,000 whistleblowers in the UK. Um, my question really is about, um, you mentioned the Tea Party and uh, the role of politics. Do you think um, there needs to be a limit on uh, ph philanthropic giving um, going into the political sphere? And do you see a role for kind of codes or good governance when people are thinking about giving? or people are, our charities are accepting money? 
Yes and yes. I mean, there is a very strict code in this country about charitable money going to the political system. It can't. You are not allowed to give charitable money to the political system, and the politicians have to be very open about what they receive. The scandals we've had, Suppergate is it being called at the moment, are all illustrations of what a bright light we shine on that in this country. But what I was describing is the way without funding political parties, the political space is funded and supported. And I think that in all sorts of fields, I was talking about social policy, but you could talk about medical research or environmental policy, the way in which civil society organises creates the space in which politicians can move. It makes it possible for political decisions to be made. And the funding that I was describing by those 12 big US foundations, I don't think very much of it went to a political party. I mean, their laws are slightly different, but I don't think it did. What it did was it created the intellectual architecture and the communication ability and the advocates and the ambassadors that enabled politicians to take particular stances. An example in this country is a difficult one. And I find it very difficult indeed, because in 1998, I think, Ed Balls, then rather junior person in the Treasury but in government, said to a big conference of those of us concerned about child poverty, I want you out there pushing your buggies, waving your rattles, calling for an end to child poverty. And I have to say, my view then was, <laughs> you're in the government, you fix it. Why should we do all this work? I think that what he was saying in a really crude and rather unhelpful way is we need you to create the space in which we can move because politicians are facing huge numbers of conflicting priorities. We need a sense that there is a concern about an issue, that there is a way of dealing with it, that there are solutions, the poor are not always with us, we can do something about it. And I do think in that period, and this is long before I was at Joseph Rantry Foundation, 98 to 2000 when they wobbled a bit about it, the government wobbled, we didn't. Um, the government took notice of the evidence, looked at the solutions, and the figures show they got more children out of poverty. They did make those changes because I think there was a public mood generated by some networks of people, by the churches, by some voluntary organisations, that enough was enough in a very rich country. We could not have children who couldn't get the books they needed for school. It was not acceptable. So I think it's the combination of movements that make for change. But I'm absolutely clear, the day we start funding political parties is not just unlawful, it would also cross that bridge in a way that I think would be really dangerous. My name is uh, Alex John and I'm a CISI member. I wonder, Julia, whether you have any views on venture philanthropy or social impact investing, I investing not just for a social return but also for a financial one, and whether you think this is a, an area for growth or even perhaps a challenge to the more traditional philanthropy sector? I think, it's, I think it runs alongside traditional philanthropy and is challenging how we all behave. Um, I was personally incredibly heavily involved in setting some of it up and I think there's some really interesting things thinking going on. I have some caveats. I don't think you can always, I know you can't always monetize social change. And I think it's attractive to be able to say that you can precisely me measure the financial benefits from some social change. So I think, to be technical, the social impact bonds in the prison in Peterborough are really, really interesting because you can measure what happens to people as they come out of prison and you can work out precisely how much it would cost if their behaviour goes one way or the other. But many, many other areas of social policy are not that straightforward. And for me, it's not surprising that prisons are at the front line of this development and we have found it hard to find the next. There is a very real risk that if we try and measure everything, we only value what we can measure. When I chaired the Adventure Capital Fund, which was on the precursors of this, and we invested very heavily, I became increasingly concerned that it was easier for a nursery to get investment for us because they could prove, to use my earlier example, that women could get into work and therefore money was coming into the community, than it would have been to care for older people in a particularly innovative way because the financial return, the social return was not so measurable. So I suppose, to paraphrase that old thing, you know, if you only, I must get this the right way around, the risk is if you count what you can measure, you, that's all you measure and that's what you think counts. So that's my caveat. That being said, that's one caveat. The second caveat is this one I said about people who think that social good is easy to manage. 
and I have met too many wealthy philanthropists or investors who believe that if only business methods could be applied to these really tricky social problems, they could be sorted out. And I've met many of them disappointed because actually it's tricky stuff. And that when you come into a big charity and look at what people are doing, it's challenging to the most experienced businessman or woman. So venture philanthropy, I think, has huge merits. But it needs to be tempered with some of that humility that I was talking about earlier. For more information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.